everyone and welcome to our latest video in which I talk to professional photographers about the techniques that they use for particular images. Today I'm delighted to be talking to Paul Sanders who is a workshop leader and a Fujifilm ex-photographer. Hi Paul, how are you? Hi Angie, uh, really good, thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. I'm quite excited actually. <laughs> That's nice to know. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great to see you. You look very well. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing your pictures that you're going to share. Yeah, well, I think uh, I think to be honest, the isolation thing is actually really helping me because uh, I'm I'm very I'm very relaxed at the minute, which is which is quite nice. And I'm looking forward to sharing a couple of the images and telling you the the sort of the story behind them, if you like. Great. Okay. Well, I think. Uh, there's a lot of people who aren't feeling very relaxed at the moment so hopefully um listening to you and seeing your images will help them feel a bit more relaxed as well let's hope so i think i mean i think this is a really good time for photographers to to actually connect with their home environment because we all as photographers want to travel to places to photograph them and we all neglect our home we always think oh well, i need to go to scotland to take great pictures or i need to go to namibia to take a great picture for most people, within a five mile radius of their house, there are really, really lovely, simple locations. Um, even if you live in the middle of a, a town or a city, and with the, the fact that we're kind of in a bit of lockdown at the moment, actually you get the streets to yourself. If you can, if you can work in taking your camera out on your daily exercise, nobody's going to stop you from pausing somewhere for five, 10, 15 minutes while you make a picture because actually you're on your exercise. Carrying a backpack is good exercise. Gets your heart rate up, certainly gets mine up. <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah, you know, and I think, I think we have to have a, a very positive attitude to, to where we are. Yes, it's hard. Yes, people are seriously ill and dying and the country is under tremendous pressure. But for each of us personally, that journey will be very different. And I think if we can use the creative tools that we, we enjoy, you get a lot more out of the, the isolation. You're looking at the, the positives. I would expect to see at least a couple of amazing A's or F panels come out of isolation. I think that the, the possibilities are, are immense. I think it's going to be interesting to see a lot of images coming out of this. I mean, there's, there's going to be some fantastic documentary work about what people are getting up to while they're isolated. But I think, like you say, it, it could be really interesting to see people looking at the five mile radius of their house and re-examining it and discovering all sorts of images. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky. I live right on the edge of the countryside. So for me, I suppose it is a little bit easier, but I, I did used to, you know, until a year ago, I lived in, the, in a flat in the middle of town. And actually I used to find it really inspiring just going out at different times of the day and night just seeing how things change and develop, you know, and if you pay attention to what's around you, you start to see things that you'd never noticed before, because we all tend to go to places, you know, without enjoying the journey. Now's a great time to enjoy the journey. You know, even while you're queuing outside the supermarket, you know, there's a really great documentary piece of people queuing to get in the supermarket, I'm sure. Because people can't get close enough to tell you not to take their photo either. <laughs> <laughs> I think in, in more normal times though that the, the, the planning of a trip and the journey it's an opportunity for us to kind of go from one thing particularly if you're not a professional photographer it allows you from transitioning to transition from your normal life to right and now I'm a photographer and I'm in in my photography space whereas at the moment we're kind of dragged out of our normal situation so we can perhaps what we need to do is think like we're on a trip, a holiday or whatever, and just try and think like photographers now, rather yeah. than sort of look for always what we're gonna do afterwards. Yeah, I think it's very important. I, I often find, I mean, the number of workshops I do, when people arrive at the location, they put so much pressure on themselves because they've got, you know, perhaps a week or 10 days off work where they've come to be a photographer, to, to kind of live, sleep eat and breathe photography and they they put an awful lot of pressure on themselves that actually they find it really hard to see um, and to connect with locations um, and I, I think now we're in a position where we are all on an enforced holiday so we can use this time to practice how we approach the, su the subject of going out for a, a walk 
and maybe creating some pictures and taking the pressure off ourselves so that when we do go forward to a more normal time and let's hope it's soon um people can can arrive at a workshop and go actually this is just like what happened when we were all stuck at home i've i've been able to practice arriving at a location and exploring and the pressure is less on them so actually they get more and more out of it because i think you know often it takes people a good couple of days to unwind from their normal scenario before they start opening themselves up to possibilities um, and sort of giving themselves permission to, to experiment. And now is a really good time to give yourself permission to try a few new things. I mean, I've, I've bought a, a film camera um, and I now have a load of chemicals. So I haven't processed film since 1990 something or other. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've got a pack of cyanotype um, chemicals that I'm also going to try. Um, I, I started making books, you know, and it's all stuff I've wanted to do, but not had the time to do. And because we've now got time, it's the perfect opportunity to, to experiment, to play, if you like, make mistakes, lock yourself in the shed or wherever you choose to, to hide away with your, with your hobby. And then you're not under the feet of your partner and you can go back and you know you can say hey look what i've done in the shed and give them a book um or give them a really nice print or you know get the kids involved in making some prints or something you know when it's sunny it's not so sunny here in kent today but you know it's a really good time to to experiment and introduce other members of the family maybe to to photography um so i i'm seeing this as purely positive which probably makes me a bit of a lunatic I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's it's a difficult situation that we don't have any, we can't change. We, we need to obey all of the rules and the guidelines, but we can't change yeah. anything. So actually, um, if those things are out of your control, you're better focusing on things which are within your control and trying to make them as positive as possible. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and once you, you know, once you're dealing with the things that are in your control, I think actually the whole situation becomes a lot more bearable. And strangely, as soon as you start doing things that take you a little bit out of your comfort zone, let's, let, you know, let's say you, you're going to get into printing or you're going to process a film or you're going to go and shoot a little project in the garden, the time flies. Because once you get into that state of flow, you suddenly find that you, you've spent two hours in the garden photographing a daisy. And you don't know where the time's gone, you know, but if you do that every other day, your, your period of isolation and social distancing becomes one very productive and very mentally positive, but it also becomes quite fulfilling and it goes quicker. Yeah. Um, you know, rather than just waiting for the end of it, which, you know, could be a couple of weeks, could be a couple of months. We don't know. And of course, anything that you learn within the confines of your, your shed or your back garden or your house, you can take that anywhere, you know, exactly. you go out, you know, up to Scotland to do that landscape trip that you wanted, but the skills that you've learned in your back garden can really help. Yeah. And I know, you know, if you're, um, if you're a people photographer, which I, which I'm not, you can, the skills that you learn in your back garden are very transferable, you know, because you, you can, you can still look at light and you can still look at composition, even if it's using a flower. You know, you can play with those ideas. You can try, you know, if you use lights, which, you know, which I don't, um, you know, you can mess around with the different lightings because you've got the time to play and you don't have to share the ideas with anybody until you've got it, until you've got it right, until you've kind of experimented and played to your heart's content. And, and there's a, you know, this is a wonderful time for learning. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I'm really focusing on is actually I have time now to learn and develop new skills, put some pra practice into ideas that I've had that I've sort of just skimmed the edges of recently um, and, and sort of hopefully come out of it in a slightly stronger place. Yes, poorer, uh, but healthier, I hope, um, but stronger creatively. Um, you know, and I think it's important that, that people, people take the time that they've been given as a gift and not look at the at the negatives um, because you know I, I I think there are lots of positives to be had you know out of this if you can stay healthy. 
Okay, so would now be a good time to share your first image? It would be, yes. I took a deep breath then, did you notice? That's kind of real, I don't know, I'm really nervous. <laughs> I've got really nervous all of a sudden. <laughs> um, right, so what I'll do is I'll flick the, the screen over. Uh, so hopefully this will go fairly smoothly. Um, so bear with me while I just switch you across. So a lot of the work I shoot is, is long exposure. Um, and I know there's a bit of a, a thing about the cliche of a milky water and blurry skies and things like that, but um, long exposure photography for me actually was the vehicle that really helped me recover uh, mentally from a breakdown after I left my previous job at the Times. And the, the important thing to, to remember is that when you're, when you're making pictures, the pictures that you make, if you put your heart and soul into it, actually become reflections of you. The uh, Minor White said that every photograph is a, a self-portrait. And it's, it's, it's really important to really give yourself over to the moment and allow the subjects that you're dealing with to talk to you in a particular way because you share a relationship with your subject. The picture that I've got up on the screen at the moment, it's quite an early one. So it's not, it's not by any stretch of the imagination um, a sort of a, a great or an inspiring picture. But for me, it's quite important because this picture is the picture that became the vehicle for me um, to actually take my uh, therapy seriously. Um, and the, the therapist um, stole the picture off my um, Facebook site because I would always tell her what, what I thought she wanted to hear rather than telling her the truth. Um, and she just put the picture down in front of me one day. And she said, talk to me about this photograph. And I said to her, you know, I started off with all the technical stuff about how you shoot it. And she's like, well, no, I, I want to know why there's a broken stick in the middle of a flat, calm sea. She said, I have no interest in how you did it. I want to know why. And I, I said, well, I, I use that long exposure technique because it allows me to calm down. Because in my in my head, um, the 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 result of the sort of the breakdown, the depression left my head a bit like a mistune radio, and and I said, what I'm looking for is calm. I look for peace, and through long exposure photography, because of the time the exposure takes, I can sit and lose myself in the landscape, and that sort of calmness. Then when I look at the picture when I print it out, I get a reflection of the calm that I felt during the process. So the whole thing becomes um, a sort of a, a kind of a circular meditation. Um, and although on the beach, I hadn't actually recognized the brokenness of the stick, there is an element of self-portrait in that picture. Um, you know, it's kind of, there I am, and there is what I'm searching for. But, you know, you sort of have this thing that every photograph has to be perfect with its leading lines and all the rest of it. And I, I purely believe that photography is self-expression. And if you, if you remove yourself from the, the formula of photography, um, your pictures become much more personal and you, you then stop looking for validation from outside sources to say, you're a great photographer, you've won a competition, or you know, this is worth a 10 at the camera club. If they're pictures that work for you, that should be enough for you. If you if you've given you know if you've given yourself over to a subject, and it's said something back to you, that's that's enough validation. That that means you're a good photographer in itself because you are in touch with yourself and your subject. Whether other people get it doesn't make any difference. Um, you know, a lot of the great photographers that we you know we follow, you know, barely barely had any kind of following at the, you know, when they were around, it's only after their death, you know, so I'm hoping that when I die, somebody will discover my work and I'll be really rich and famous. Uh, well, my son might be rich and famous, <laughs> but you know, the important thing for me is the creation and it's allowing myself to express myself visually in a way that I can't verbally. Um, so that's how I use photography. Um, the technical side of long exposure is something that a lot of people get a bit scared about um, and I've done a lot on workshops with people who when I say to them what exposure you're using they, I'm just guessing because 
there's a there's an element of of maths within long exposure but the the simple rule of thumb i always use is that i set up the camera without any filters maybe a graduated filter co to control the contrast between the land and the sky or the sea and the sky i then have a basic exposure which i always try and make around about a quarter of a second um, and i may use an extra solid nd filter perhaps a two stop or a three stop just to bring the exposure down to a quarter of a second if i get to a quarter of a second i know that with my 10 stop my my big stopper i know that that's going to be about four minutes and 16 seconds that's maths i can do and maths i can remember um, and i don't need to kind of count on my fingers and toes how much it is because i can also work out the exposure either side of that so an eighth of a second is two minutes a quarter of a second is a minute you know a half a second is eight minutes that that's the the simplicity because for me it has to be very simple because i am i am so not very technical and so not very into maths um that i can understand why people people try and guess because it just gets too complicated and there is a lot of um there's a, there's a lot of hype around how technical photography can be and some people really love that side of it uh, and that's fine if you do, but if you're just in it for making images that express yourself, you're probably not so technical. So you need to just be able to kind of experiment a little bit and play um, to allow allow feelings to come through. So simple rule of thumb, write it on the back of your hand, what each one write, or on a piece of paper, and then you don't need to kind of do loads of complicated, um, you know, calculations. So just looking at this image. Yes. Uh, it was probably a four minute exposure you said um, <laughs> yeah. looking at the the post and sort of like the height of the blur it was obviously quite a choppy is it a sea or a, it must be the sea is it yeah it is it's the sea it's um near to winter chelsea beach in um in uh, i think it's just on the border of kent and sussex uh, near rye yeah. um, but it's right down on the south coast it's one of my favorite beaches because the whole beach has lots and lots of broken sticks um, and I think as a starting point for long exposure photography, sticks in the sea are a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it was quite, it was quite choppy. Um, although this is taken on a longish lens because I'm, I'm back away from the beach. I think it was taken on the 50 to 140 on the Fuji. This was in the days I was using the X-T2. I'm now on a, a GFX. Um, but, you know, a lot of people think you have to use a wide angle lens for long exposure you know only if you want to get the sky in sometimes you get really lovely minimalist feel to your pictures if you if you shoot with a longer lens you can isolate the subject um, the other tip i would say is don't always stop down to f22 which is what a lot of people do because they're trying to lengthen the exposure by stopping the aperture down i tend to shoot a lot of my long exposures at 2.8 or f4 or 5.6 and then put an extra neutral density filter in before I put the 10 stop in. So like I said in the earlier, use maybe a two or a three stop to bring your exposure down before you put the 10 stop in and then calculate your exposure from there. Um, because that shallow depth of field actually helps with the blur of the background. So you isolate your subject, it makes the subject a bit stronger. Uh, so most of the work I shoot, the apertures are quite wide open. Rarely do I shoot at um, sort of 22. The other advantage with shooting wide open is it doesn't matter how much dirt is on your sensor, um, because sensor dirt is a nightmare. Um, and if you're down at f22, especially with long exposures where you get blurry seas and blurry skies, to have it look like it's raining kind of black blobs, and then have to spend hours touching them out. If you can, if you can minimise the amount of work you do in camera, then then do it. So I, I'm I'm not very technical and I'm very lazy. Um, you know, so if uh, if if you're like me and you don't really kind of want to do loads of Photoshop, um, two eight four five point six are great because you don't get the sense of dirt. <laughs> Okay, and I, I can I can really see the connection between um, you know taking this photograph and helping you sort of calm down and feel more um, collected. Yeah, that really makes sense to me because I can just imagine sort of like looking at the choppy sea and that's your that's how your mind is feeling, but then sort of waiting for that 
that four minute exposure and then it, it appears and it is calm i can i can i can see the kind of the process there yeah but it, it wasn't um it's quite strange because it wasn't a, a conscious i'm walking along the beach there's a stick that looks like me it it was very much um it was like an instinctive thing it was almost it was almost subconscious i was very aware but also unaware it, it was like being very switched on and very in the moment but unaware of other other sides of it and it was quite it was quite strange and it was only looking back at it that i started to see especially with the the work that my therapist was was doing with me um and i think you should spend time reflecting on your pictures i make a lot of notes when i when i photograph i rarely make notes about what um you know what i'm sort of photographing with or what settings i'm using um it's always about what i feel what the weather was doing what i could taste what i could smell what i could hear what i could feel underneath my feet you know it's all of that because photography is very very visceral um it's it's not uh it's not two-dimensional the, the only thing that is two dimensional is the photograph at the end of it. But if you've connected with the entire experience, the picture should be able to transport you back to that moment, you know, so you can still see or taste or feel things. Um, you know, so I often journal about my work when I'm, when I'm taking it. I mean, you've got four minutes to sit down and take a picture. You can, you can make some notes. Um, you know, and if you've left the long exposure noise reduction on, you get another four minutes to sit and make some notes. So I would always say, turn it off unless you want to do an eight minute meditation. Because <laughs> 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 you know, it's, there's lots of little, little things that sort of come into play. The, the time of sitting while your exposure goes is not one for looking around for your next exposure. I tend to sit and watch what I'm photographing. You know, sit away from the camera and just watch the subject. Watch how the light changes on it. Listen to the noise of whatever it is that's around your subject. You know, just throw your hearing out as far as you can to, to capture all the sound. And you, it becomes a really mindful way of being. And you can take that mindful approach to photography into your everyday life. So sometimes if life gets too busy, you can just find something to focus on for just a couple of minutes slow your breathing down and you find that you're 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 that much calmer and um, you know i always find that sitting and watching the subject while my exposure is running really slows my breathing and my heart rate down i become less anxious and um, you know it it's quite incredible had i had i realized the power of photography and art to to help heal i would have connected with it in this way a lot sooner um you know and it's it's very enjoyable because you don't have to share it either you know, it doesn't have to not everything you take has to go onto your social media feed and um, you can keep some of it private just for you to put in a book with your notes um, you know you don't you don't need to display your inner emotions to the world um, if you don't want to you know i i choose to because it helps me but i know other people are quite shy about it so and that's understandable do you think you would have got to um or maybe it would have taken a bit longer but your it was your therapist who kind of started asking you about this this image and questioning you around it do you think you would have sort of moved to the way you are now without those initial questions or had you already started to realize there was something very calming about taking long exposure photographs? I think I'd started to realize that there was something very calming about it. Um, it was only when she really sort of focused on, on it that it, it started to come into light. And then I started to do a bit more, a bit more reading um, around contemplative photography, mindful photography, uh, photography as sort of therapy. Um, and it's quite a, it's, there's quite a big movement. Um, there's a, a college, uh, well, a hospital down at Roehampton that, that looks at photography as therapy. There's a, 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 ther a photography therapy centre in Lucca in Italy 
and um, and it all allows people to just to show bits of their life they don't you don't even have to be um you know for want of a better term a good photographer you know or a proficient photographer some people will just take pictures of items during the day that they come across that resonate with them um you know they they're not even um the sort of beautifully composed beautifully exposed some of them are, are phone snapshots some of them are you know taken on all sorts of things of all sorts of things and then other people you know some people are cutting them out and making montages out of them and it's incredible to see how people use visuals to express how they feel um you know i mean i i think i'm slightly um conditioned by the fact that i've been a photographer since i left school so i don't kind of chop up my pictures too much um you know being a news photographer for a number of, you know the majority of my life means i don't over you know over complicate them I, I try and keep everything very simple but i kind of wish i actually had the freedom to start chopping my pictures up and cutting them into pieces um, a lot of the people i've worked with on one-to-ones you know some uh, some teenagers I worked with um, suffer with, uh, you know, sort of self-harming issues. When they take pictures, they then go and cut them up. And, you know, I can see exactly why they're cutting them. And often they'll cut them in the same way that they would cut it themselves. So they just slice them. And it sounds quite gruesome, but what they're doing is expressing something in a different way. And if that helps them to overcome the self-harm aspect of their life then that's a very powerful thing so it doesn't matter how much they chop into them and one young lady who um worked with me for a, a while you know she she said that the the cutting of the pictures had replaced the cutting of her legs and every photograph that she did she would cut and then reveal another photograph underneath it and the picture underneath it was always a lot more personal than the cut one and it was incredibly powerful. I spoke to the lady who was helping her, her therapist uh, with the young lady's permission. And the woman said that the work this girl was producing was so powerful that she was now using it to show other kids. Um, and and that's, that's what I love about photography, the sharing of, a, of something, sharing of an idea, the sharing of an image can help somebody else. Um, and and that's what I'm really passionate about. You know, the the way photography can help mobilise somebody to to change a, an aspect of their life that maybe they're not happy with, or express something in their life that they're struggling with, it is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, I mean, and I know some of us are in it just because we like creating a nice picture, and that's absolutely fine. But there's a there's a bigger vehicle for it as well. Um, and having been somebody who suffered, you know, massively, um, if I can put a little bit back into that helping, you know, with my photography, then it's great, you know, but first and foremost, it's really helped me. The fact that I can give back is, is, is amazing. Yeah, that's a kind of therapy in itself, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You know, it makes you feel, uh, it makes you feel worthwhile. Um, and for a long time, I didn't feel very worthwhile or worthy of anything. So you know, when you're able to help and support other people, um, you suddenly realise that you have a value that you may not have noticed before. And that even, you know, even your work might not have a financial value, but it has a, an emotional value to people, which is, which is actually more valuable. Okay, well, I mean, in essence, this is an extremely simple image, but it's also a very, very powerful one. And obviously there's yeah. a, lot, a lot of depth to it. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I think that's the thing. You can look at it as a stick in the sea and go, oh, it's milky water around a stick. Or, you know, there's a whole backstory going on that some people connect with and some people don't. And, you know, people who look at the photograph have to be entitled to look at it in their own way. Um, I, once I put a picture out, I, 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 I let go of the ownership I feel to it. So it'll always mean, you know, what it means to me, but I have to let other people have a relationship with the image in a way that they see fit. Um, whether that's positive or negative, whether they like it or not, doesn't, it doesn't matter to me in a, you know, in a kind of an artistic way. 
you know, so if they say, I don't like that picture, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, I, I probably don't like more of my pictures than anybody else. So it's fine for other people to say they don't like them. Um, and then those that, that do like it and connect with it, they're really, really valuable. Um, you know, because they're, they're few and far between, but they've connected with it in, um, in a deeper way than it being just about, it's a picture of a stick. You know? and, and that's what I, that's what I like when people can see something that resonates with themselves in one of the pictures that I've taken. Do you have another that you'd like to share with us? I do. So this is, um, Sycamore Gap up in, um, uh, well, it's sort of on the border of uh, Northumberland and Cumbria, I think. Um, I, I love Sycamore Gap, um, partly because I've always been fascinated with it because in the Robin Hood Prince of Thieves film, Robin Hood makes out that it's uh, very close to Dover. Um, and I, I love the fact that you have to travel most of the country to find it. Uh, and he comes off the beach at Dover and there he is in a tree. Uh, <laughs> so it's always been somewhere that I've just... I've just had a, a, a thing for, um, but I spent a year shooting panoramas. Um, I shot nothing but pa uh, stitch panoramas for, uh, for a whole year because I wanted to change the way I saw the world. Um, and at that, before that, I'd always been shooting everything four by three. And frankly, I'd got a little bit bored of that format. Um, so I challenged myself to, to just shoot in the, the stitch, format whether it be upright whether it be landscape and it was a really really wonderful discipline um, because there are problems that you come against um, there are little challenges that you you sort of you have to meet um, and it becomes really enjoyable when other people are there doing their picture in the standard way to be looking at things and thinking right how can how does this work in a wider way you know what what's on my peripheral vision that i've not i've not taken in um so it, it sort of it it became um it became quite a challenge but I, I managed to to do the year and to be honest i was very grateful when the year was over um as with most challenges and projects i think you you get to the kind of december bit of it and you're thinking i can't wait for january to try something new um but this particular image i I'd wanted to take it for some time. I'd taken a picture um, a number of years before and I wasn't, I wasn't happy with it. And I knew the image that I sort of wanted to, to try and create. But I arrived at dawn um, thinking that would be the best time because the light comes up from the right hand side of the image. And in the winter, it's on the front of the wall. So sort of just over my, my right shoulders, I'm looking at it now. And when I got there, the whole scene was bathed in the most gorgeous, warm light. The sky was all pinks and peachy colours. And I know most photographers would have been skipping around with glee, but I personally don't like colour. I'm, I'm massively, massively against colour in my own work. I, rare, well, I never take a photograph in colour apart from my iPhone. Um, and I stood there with the saddest look on my face that this whole scene was bathed in this gorgeous light. And I, I kept thinking to myself, oh, I bet Joe Cornish would love this light. And I'm thinking, you know, I just want it to be grey and moody and dark and horrible and a bit rainy. And, um, but I, I persevered and I set my tripod up and I knew what I wanted. I effectively waited for nearly 10 hours to get the picture. Um, I kept nipping back over to the sill where they, they do the most amazing coffee and bacon sandwiches, which is just over the road from, from Sycamore Gap. And I kept coming back and people were saying, oh, what are you waiting for? Is it a bird? Is it this? Is it that? And I was like, no, I'm just waiting for it to be a bit darker. Uh, really, what I should have done was, was just packed up and gone home. But I just had this level of commitment to, to that particular scene that made me wait and wait and wait. Um, and there's, a, there's another quote by uh, Minor White, who's one of my favorite photographers, I just love his work, um, that says, if you spend, uh, you know, if you give the object of your attention enough time, basically it will affirm your presence and it will tell you when to take a photograph. Um, and I waited and waited and waited and the sun actually went down. So it was about 10, 10 hours later. And I, I was thinking, blimey, this has been a really long day. And then as the sun went down, 
the afterglow in the sky just sort of kicked up a little bit. And I just thought, oh, oh, each photograph in this stitch panorama is two minutes. And I think there's eight frames in total. So by the time I'd got to the end of it, it had actually got dark. But because when you shoot panoramas, you don't alter your exposure. I really enjoy the transition of day to night in the photograph. And I'd spent so much time with that tree that I began to see the tree as me. And at that particular point, I was kind of in a quandary of, if I stayed in my kind of slightly depressed state, would my photography stay the same? Or if I got better, would I lose the ability to see pictures in the way that I saw them? And I was very worried at that point that if I got better, I would stop seeing the world in a way that worked for me and I would just end up giving up photography. So this, this picture is, the, is that thing of, you know, on the right hand side, you've got the, the darkness of my kind of illness, if you like. And on the left hand side, you've got the light off in the distance where I'm sort of hoping to be. But if I get to the light, am I not going to be able to take photographs? Am I going to forget what it is? Am I going to lose the emotional connection? Um, and as I recover, because I've used photography to recover, does that mean once you're better, you stop taking the pills? So do I stop taking pictures once I get better? And I was really, I was really anxious about it. Um, you know, Fortunately, since that point, I've kind of marched up the hill on the left and gone into the light, which is which is great. And my photography has changed a lot. So it's quite it's quite an interesting picture to look back on. The other thing that I really like about this image is that I printed it for an exhibition and um, it was the light and land exhibition at the uh, not light and land. It was um, oh, it was an exhibition at the Octo Centre and I can't remember now what it was called, um, but there were five of us. And I, um, I had printed out all these pictures and this one was really, really huge. It was nearly three meters long. Um, and the, uh, the framer that had done part of the work had really mucked up the framing and I'd had a proper diva fit in the car park with the pictures that this other guy had framed. And then this one had been done by, um, been done by Genesis because of the scale of the picture and they'd framed it beautifully. And, all the rest of it. So I ended up just putting one picture up for the exhibition um, and somebody came over to me and they said, you may not have many, but what you have is the one with the most impact. And that's because it filled the entire wall. And I keep looking, I mean, I've not, I never sold the picture. Um, I can't, I, you know, I, mean, I don't think anybody has got the wall space to hang it apart from the Oxo Gallery. But if anybody wants it, it's sitting in my barn, still framed and looking beautiful. But <laughs> there's, and I look at it every time I go in to get the lawnmower out. And I just think, you know, there's something so magical about that day spent up on the, up on the moors, looking at that tree and meeting people who were kind of walking and sort of curious about what I was doing and there was another photographer came and went and it was an amazing day and then just to see it as a turning point because I I could have given myself permission to stay in a, a state of semi-depression um, and not hold myself out of it because it becomes quite comfortable at times although mental illness is not very nice it becomes it becomes quite reassuring because you know where everything is and you become, you become quite isolated. You, you let yourself push the world away. Um, and I was at that position where I felt quite safe in my depression, but I knew that to move forward, I needed to, to, you know, grow a pair if you like and get over the next hill. Um, but there was a lot, you know, there was genuinely a lot of, a lot of angst about it. So that's, that's the sort of story behind the picture um you know but for me every time i look at it i just smile at the whole it was getting darker as i was taking the picture and i knew the exposure should be getting longer but i i, I stuck with the original plan and now i look at it and i just i, I just love that transition um you know because it's not often in a single picture you can get the transition from night to day in in enough space and then print it big enough to really feel it um, you know, so I, I get quite excited when I look at it. And when I look at the print, I, I, I get very excited because I'm a big fan of print, the printed work. And I think it, it completes the circle of connection to have your work 
actually as a print um you know it's where it's where photographs belong because until that and you know if you're shooting digitally they are just ones and zeros um you know and at some point all the computers will upgrade and we'll lose all our images so by by getting them printed you know it gives them a, a gives them a deeper life and gives you a deeper connection with your work i'd love to see the print <laughs> I'll bring it round. <laughs> right, so I, don't you, I don't think you should sell it. I think it's too too important to your story and to you. I don't know. I could do with the money at the minute. <laughs> well, you need a bigger wall. Maybe you need to have it. Yeah, I need a bigger. I, I need a bigger house. <laughs> One of the things I find interesting about it, from a from the sort of the process of producing it, is that obviously you shot it from left to right. Yes. So you started with the bright and you've gone to the dark. Yeah. But when we look at it, we, we do see it as a transition from the dark to the light. Yeah. Which is, I think, quite interesting. And, and when you were speaking, it was all about that. But obviously, yeah. it, it was completely in, in reverse. Yeah, it's, it, it's quite a weird thing because as I've reflected on that print, I, it can, I see more and more in it. And I always shoot panoramas vertically and left to right because that's the way we read um, and when you put them into Lightroom or Photoshop it makes sense when you're when you're going to stitch them that they they go left to right because that's the way you naturally look at an image and you build an image that way um, but all the while you know since then it's been about right to left not left to right um, and it's it is quite it is quite a strange image because it reads so easily right to left. Um, and ordinarily, you know, being a Western society, we struggle with images that read right to left because we don't read that way. You know, if you go to the Middle East where they do read that way, I wonder if they would read it left to right. I wonder if they would read it left backwards. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah, it is, it's a really funny, image. that's why I picked it because it does, it throws up quite a few sort of questions for me when I look at it you know I keep thinking why you know how did that happen and that's one of the joys of shooting long exposure and panoramas is do you get happy accidents um you know had I been really thinking about it I probably would have been adjusting the exposure as I went along to compensate for the fact it was getting darker if I'd got that ability and the fact that happily the dark has sort of kicked in but it hasn't gone completely black you know there's still some detail in the in that far right hand corner you know that's all a happy accident and yet it tells so much of the story just to you know just to sort of let it be if you like you know so i i've got the concept but that's done by all that work is done by the subjects it's not done by me you know, I've actually been quite lazy. All I've done is to turn the camera through a few degrees and left the exposure as it was. That's all the subject speaking to me. Um, you know, did, you agree? Did, did it give you some challenges when doing the, the, the merging? Because of the, not because of the know, change, but because of the darkness change. I'll, I'll be really honest with you. That's the, one of the few images that I merged that I had to do very little to. Because often when you're merging skies, the skies don't line up properly. But for some reason, I did this one in Lightroom. Um, I, always, I always try them in Lightroom first. And if Lightroom struggles, I then do them in Photoshop, um, just using the automate um, feature. But I did this one in Lightroom and it works straight away. And I was astounded. Um, the, um, you know, the, there was sort of one little bit of cloud kind of in the top left hand corner that didn't line up very well on the first on the first go so I've just darkened that that down a little bit that's just sort of over to the left and that was it sort of stepped because I think maybe I don't know what had happened but apart from that little bit the rest of it is as it as it happened and then all I've done after that is just pulled the the darkness and the not darkness the contrast and the brightness a little bit um but the you know the fact it went together so easily when I was expecting it to be a real nightmare um, just adds weight to the fact that it was right. Not technically, but 
the whole sort of feeling was right. Um, and I think Lightroom actually handles the the process of putting that one together really, really well. Um, you know, it just, even the down to the textures in the rock, the, there was no sort of weird overlap, which sometimes you get. Um, I was really surprised and quite happy because it would have been an absolute pain to try and make it work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you put a lot of effort into it, waiting the whole day, the 10 hours, and then doing, what did you say, eight exposures? Eight exposures for two minutes. For two minutes, yeah. yeah. I guess you had but, significant overlap between them. That Yeah, I mean, you, you, I always overlap by about a third. Mm -hmm. So you rotate through. I use the grid lines a lot in the camera to make sure you get that third overlap. And always better to have too many pictures than not enough. Um, the hardest bit with shooting a, a panorama is actually getting your tripod level. Because if your tripod's not level, you always end up with a kind of a weird slant or a curve and you'll miss, bit, you'll miss bits of the image. So if you can get your tripod discipline, right, so you get your tripod base level and your head level and then work out. I always do a few dry runs, you know, getting the, um, getting the start point and the end point where I want them. Um, and I always shoot the, um, my start point is always the instant of my left palm and my end point is always my right palm so that I have a frame of my left palm at the beginning and a frame of my right palm at the end. So I know when I'm looking at the grid on Lightroom, where I started and where I finished. Um, you know, just, just little things like that make the job easier. But then once you select the pictures in Lightroom and you just do the, go to the panorama setting, I can't remember which, which bit of Lightroom it's under now. Um, I think it's photo, um, but literally it just, pulls them all together it takes a few minutes um, and then you end up with a massive tiff file um, I mean this one is sort of in the region of one and a half gigabytes <laughs> so almost need a separate hard drive for the one picture <laughs> but you made a three meter print which is just yeah. incredible yeah I, I mean that's down to the skill of the guys at Genesis to be honest I mean Ken Setting is his team down there did a beautiful job with it to watch it rolling off the printer was was something quite special. I must admit, I had my heart in my mouth because everything shows up, you know, when you've done a picture that big, every tiny mark and error shows up, um, you know. But at the end of the day, I don't, I don't worry about technical perfection. I don't think perfection is something that actually exists. I think it's a man-made thing just to beat us over the head with and make us insecure. So there are things wrong, if you like, with it, but it doesn't matter to me. Uh, it's perfectly imperfect and that's where I'm happy. Well, I think that's a fantastic image and I think that's a, a great point to finish, Paul. It's, it's been really lovely speaking to you and thank you for being so candid with us. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it.